Two weeks back, we started this, this series called The Favor We All Need. You remember that one, right? And, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be continuing. We're going to be parking ourselves in that conversation. Is that okay? Right? Now, now I have a task at hand, and I say this genuinely. Uh, I'm going to try my best to, to capture uh, what the Lord has been putting on my heart for this entire week and a half as we prepare for this, for, for this time of learning. So I need your help. Are you ready to help me? Yeah, that's not convincing. <laughs> that's, that's not really very convincing, okay? Right, we've been talking about favor. Somebody say this with me. Somebody say favor. favor. Somebody say like you ate your lunch and try that one more time and say favor. favor. Okay, that's good. You know, we have been unpacking this series on this one phrase that the favor of God brings enlargement. We, we saw that, uh, and I want to center this entire conversation on this, what this new, it's not a new idea that I'm trying to present to you. It's there in your Bibles, right? Uh, if you know somebody who's sitting next to you, just tell them favor, favor. is there yeah. in your Bibles, <laughs> right? You may not believe that. But trust me when I say this, it's there because there have been so many stories that have been captured. And so here's what I believe God wants us to, to learn in these few weeks. And this is kind of the vision board that we, we are painting, we are painted for ourselves and this is what we're going after. You know, when we're talking about the favor of God, we want to know the biblical revelation and understanding of favor. We want to understand the purpose of divine favor we want to understand the conditions of God's favor in your life. And we also want to learn about the kingdom impact of favor. And I believe that over the next few weeks, if you're going to be coming in, we are talking about this one theme because that's how we love to learn God's word. That, that there is so much truth and beauty in, in the scriptures. And all of this, I want to kind of tell you, it's been, it's been parked in this scripture from, the, uh, from Proverbs. If you read with me, Proverbs 3, in the NIV version, it says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. This is one of the most famous proverbs that has been quoted. And I love verse 4. It says, you will win favor, not just with God, but with man as well. Right? And so, last week we understood when we were talking about favor, favor Finding favor means gaining approval and acceptance and the blessings of God. It's, it's about God's approval over your life, over all that you do. It's God's delight over you. And it's, it's really for a purpose. And, and each and every one of you has the opportunity to walk in the favor of God. Do you believe that? Right? Let, let, me, let me say that once again. Each and every one of you can walk and live in the favor of God. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, he captured this in, in this context. Right? This, is, this is him writing about what God says to his people. This is Isaiah 66. This is what it says. These are the ones that God is saying this. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit... And who tremble at my word. Who tremble at my word. Are we a church that trembles at, the God, at God's word? Are we a church that knows how to speak? Just checking, okay? Just checking. You guys, I, come on, I need you guys, okay? I know, I know it's, 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 a bit, it's getting like quieter and quieter, right? You guys need a coffee break or something? Right? Just checking. God says this, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and those who tremble at my words are the ones that God looks on with his favor. The psalmist in fact says this, for you, O Lord, bless the righteous man 
the one who is in right standing with you, you surround him with what? With favor as a shield. And over here we get to understand that favor has been spoken about a, a kind of a protection that each and every one of us can have. Favor is, is out of the many things that favor can be for you, the psalmist is helping us understand that favor is, is equated to the shield. That means equated to the protection that we need for our lives. And so whether, whether your understanding of this truth and this principle is, is just limited to grace or just limited to favor, I want you to know this. There are two key elements that help us grow and, if I may use this word, thrive in favor. The first one is your faith. Somebody say, my faith. And the second one is our right standing. What does the Bible teach about right standing? Righteousness is a gift from God. Does, that, does your Bible say that? Right? It's not, it's not something we can earn. It's not something we can do good and then we get back right standing or righteousness. Righteousness, the scripture uses this word imputed that it means it has been given to us. And if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you need faith. But if you also want to secure your position in Christ, you need to understand that you are a chosen generation, just like the band was saying. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And, and that's why it's important for you to understand these two principles, faith and righteousness. Because if you're taking down notes, I, I really hope you can write down tonight's sermon because, you know, this is this has changed how God has taught me to see and relook at favor. To the measure, if you're writing down, write this down. To the measure you believe in Jesus and to the measure you are willing to receive your inheritance of right standing, you will learn to walk and thrive in the favor of God. So let me ask you this. Does anybody need the favor of God in this room? Yeah. Do we have people who are, who are willing, who are earnestly seeking for God's favor? Not to attain it, but to receive it. There's a difference, right? You can try hard, but you may not be able to receive it in your own efforts. But if you come to Jesus with the posture of receiving his favor, you will be surprised how God would love to lavish you with his favor. So there are many things that keep us from believing in Jesus. Let me ask you, in this season of your life, what's keeping you back from really trusting in Jesus? What's holding you back from really following him the way Jesus wants us to follow him? Let me, let me try and maybe nudge some of you. For, it could be maybe hurt or resentment in one season of your life for some of you. For, 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 for a couple of you, it could be maybe a lack of understanding or the unwillingness in your life or in your heart that is kind of stalling you from knowing this Jesus. For some of you, it could be you are set in your ways. That means you don't need anybody or you don't need the scriptures to teach you how to know Jesus. You are set in your ways. You are set in the way how you do life. You are set in the ways what you believe, what you don't want to believe. For some of you, it could be your pride as well. That is stalling you from having faith in you. That is birthing faith in you. Now whatever the reason is for not believing in Jesus, we are talking about God's favor, right? And out of the many characters that help us learn about the favor of God, tonight I want us to learn from the life of Joseph. You know, the life of Joseph is one of the classic touch points and one of the classic references of God's favor being manifested in and through him. Right? Do, do you agree with me? Right? If you have not read about the life of Joseph, I want to encourage you, go back and read the book of Genesis from chapter 37 to chapter 50. Can you imagine this is possibly one of the most lengthiest chapters or, or spaces in the Bible that has been given to one character. Thirteen chapters have been written about the life of Joseph. And so, 
It teaches us about the favor. It teaches us about, last week what I said, you know, God's favor is not just for you so that you can get all your answers. So that only your needs can be taken care of. God's favor on your life is so that his purposes can be fulfilled through each and every one of you. Come on, I need somebody to wake up in this place and respond to me, people. I'm being needy right now. Thank you. The guys who are here, after a while. Come on, let's talk, okay? Let's talk. Because, like I said, I need your help. And I'll tell you why I need your help. Disclaimer, this is going to get bad. Joseph's life teaches us about a lot of important principles about God's favor. But what I want to talk to you tonight is the difference between favoritism and favor. Somebody say with me, favoritism, favoritism. And, favor. and favor. There's a massive difference in both. Joseph's life teaches us about that. Now before I unpack this, Let's read 39, Genesis 39, verses 3 to 5. Now Israel, that is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was born to him in his old age. And he made an honored robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. Huh, can, can somebody say this out loud? They hated him all the more. This is next level of sibling rivalry. Seriously. Do you guys have siblings? Have you practiced hate? We learned it. Right? Who taught us? I don't know. We just learned it. We picked it up on the way. Nobody had to teach us to hate our sibling. Neville, I love you. <laughs> we just pick it up. I don't know who teaches us, but we just pick it up. Now, let me just unpack to you. I told you this is going to get bad, okay? Now, I know I've got some singles in the room over here. I need you to keep your conscience clean. Are you ready for this? Let me backtrack a bit as to why the Bible tells us that Jacob loved Joseph more. And why the Bible tells us why the brothers hated Joseph all the more. Not just hated, all the more. Okay? So this is what Joseph, Jacob's life, family tree looked like. I know the print is small, but just I hope you can just see this. Okay? This is the family tree of Jacob. Now, here's some background context, okay? Jacob is working for this dude called Laban, Laban all right? I'm not going to go into the backstory. Laban and him strike a deal, okay? I'm just going to narrate this story. You go back and you read your Bible. I'm not going to read the Bible for you guys, okay? Go back. Jacob says, Laban says, you work for me for seven years and your reward will be Rachel. All the single guys, you're taking notes, right? Seven years of labor and the reward is marriage with, with Rachel. That's what Jacob is, is promised, right? So this guy's like, okay, this is what true love looks like. I need to labor. I need to work for it. I'll be there. The day of the wedding comes. Jacob is about to get married. He gets married, finds out he's not married to Rachel. He is gotten married to Leah. Laban's other daughter. This is like some next level of sorcery. <laughs> Jacob in the Bible is called the trickster. This is the trickster getting tricked. This is like reverse uno. You know that's happening on, on Jacob right now. And so it's crazy that Laban brings Leah into Rachel's life. Uh, sorry, Laban brings Leah into Jacob's life. But then this guy is a much new, so he wants to... You know, on the love of Rachel. And so Laban says, okay, you know what? The deal is still on. You work for seven more years, I'll get you married to my daughter, Rachel. One struck, 
twice bit and you know you know how faithful you guys are in your relationships right true love going to do everything that's what jacob does seven years he continues to work so this guy has basically worked 14 years to get one woman and you single guys <laughs> how's your waiting game one phone call doesn't come back one email is not responded one whatsapp is not seen <laughs> she doesn't love me <laughs> this guy waits 14 years now that's not the, that's not the worst part right here's where it begins if you've ever said to yourself i have been born in a dysfunctional family <laughs> have you ever said that to yourself you guys have not seen anything Check this out. Rachel is married to Jacob. Leah is married to Jacob as well. That's why I said singles, don't get excited. Right now we are in the new covenant <laughs> of grace. One Lord, one baptism, one wife. Some of you are like, damn man, I should have been there in the Old Testament. Don't get excited. Okay, we're going to come back. We're still talking about the favor of God, okay? We're still talking about God's favor. So listen, here's what happens, okay? Please, please track with me. This is important. God, has, God sees that Jacob loves Rachel, but God decides to open up the womb of Leah while Rachel is still barren. And this is what happens. She gets these, these, these sons, Reuben, Simeon, Le Levi, Judah, uh, Issachar, and Zebulun, right? If that is not enough, Leah is like, Dil mange mor, right? And so at that time, she sends the maid, her own maidservant to go and lie with Jacob, who gives uh, two more sons to her maidservant, Zilpah, right? What is that? God and Asher, right? Now, all of this is happening, and Rachel finally is like, God, what's happening? I thought this is my true love. Jacob is like, what's happening, God? I, I thought I really loved her. Finally, I'm not going to go into the details, but Rachel says, as an interim, here, take my, take my maidservant so that at least I can have the joy of raising some kids that I can call my own. That time it was a practice that they could send their maidservants to have kids with, with, with the husband, you know. And so he gets two boys from the maidservant. Are you still okay to follow Jesus? You're like, uh, I don't know, Nenad. <laughs> All of this is happening. Finally, the Lord has compassion on Rachel. And after all of these sons is born to Rachel, Joseph. A son of old age to Jacob. A son of true love. True love wins after so many flaws and mistakes and heartbreaks and heartaches. And you thought your family is a wreck. You thought your family is messed up. Welcome to the Bible where dysfunction is so evident. Tell me, is this dysfunction? This is messed up to another level, guys. This is messed up to just another level. Finally, after so many years, he gets Joseph, and that's why the Bible teaches us Jacob loved Joseph more. There's a backstory to some of those statements that are made in the Bible. There's always a backstory. I didn't call you here to give you a family tree class. We didn't start, get started on this sermon to, to talk about who's born to whom and who had anything and for all of this. The thing that I really want to challenge you and ask you is, what is the dysfunction that you have been carrying for so many years in your life that you are so afraid to bring before God? Let me tell you, God is never moved by your dysfunction. 
God is never moved by your limitations. God is never moved by your brokenness. God is never moved by the things that are bothering you. Let me ask you, what is the dysfunction that has caused you to have feelings of hate, to have feelings of betrayal, and to have feelings of pain? You know what's the messed up part? While the rest of the 10 or the 11 kids that were growing up, they saw that their father did not love their mothers. Can you imagine what that looks like? You know, we, we hear about so many stories about family trauma, you know, where, where one son is not paid attention to or, or the, the, the daughter is not given much attention and we grow up with these rejection issues that some of you might have grown up with and say, you know, my parents never loved me or, or my father never loved me, my mother never loved me. Imagine out of the 12, 11 of them have grown up or 10 of them have grown up feeling that my father does not love me or my father does not love my mother. He loves someone else. This is the kind of life Joseph and the brothers have grown up around. No wonder the brothers hate him all the more. Do you understand it now? They did not hate him because he had a coat. The coat just made it worse. What's the saying? It's the, what broke the camel's back? The last straw. The coat was just basically rubbing it in for all that was happening in these past 10 or 15 odd years. It was, it was just the tip of the iceberg for all the pain, betrayal and everything that was happening. Now let me bring you back to help you see this. Joseph is still seen by God. Joseph is still acknowledged by who God is and what he wants to do in and through his life. Joseph but becomes this, the, the, the golden boy in the family and he becomes like this favored child. And every part of attention of Jacob goes to this kid or this teenager. Now here's something that we understand about Joseph as well. When we read those few verses, he had the gift of interpreting dreams and visions. Do you read that? Right? Now that was his gift that he was there. Now Joseph on the other hand, because of this dysfunction, forgets what immaturity for, forgets what maturity looks like. And so he has this knack of blabbering out things that God has revealed to him. Have you done that? And God gives you an idea, God gives you a vision, God gives you a dream. And before you process it, before you kind of really meditate on it, you're like, oh, this is what happened. This is what God wants to do in me. This is the calling upon my life. And nothing wrong with sharing it, but there's a time and season to share. But this time when Joseph ends up blabbering it out, he's basically just taking a gun and shooting himself. It's just making it worse for him. Here's something that God taught me. It's not that Joseph wasn't gifted. Let me, let me bring it back to our context. It's not that you're not gifted. It's not that you do not have the ability or the tenacity or the capacity to do what God is wanting you to do. But here's something that I learned. The combination of your God-given gift, your dysfunction, and your maturity is a dangerous one. Just fix your eyes on the screen for the next few minutes and just read these three phrases with me. Your God-given gift, your dysfunction, and your maturity. If you're going to do life with, with your God-given gifts, and your dysfunction, and your immaturity, you know what's coming up for you? You know the story of Joseph. Come on, say it out. A pit. <laughs> a pit. Somebody say this with me. A pit. And this is exactly what happens. In fact, he starts telling about his capacity of dreams to his father and his mother. And they get upset with him. He's like, what? You're going to rule over us? The very son who loved, uh, who was loved by the father is now being questioned that, what? You're going to teach us how to do life? So his very close people are questioning him. It just gets worse. He gets beaten by his brothers. He's betrayed by them. He's get, he gets thrown into the pit. He gets thrown. He gets sold off to the Egyptians. And here's the principle that I want you to see what we have been trying to establish all this while. In case if you didn't understand or didn't notice, we have been talking about human-centered favoritism. One act of Jacob not showing favor but somebody say it with me one more time favoritism 
showing favoritism to this one son, this is what happens. Favoritism could lead you to a pit. Immaturity will rob you from walking in your gifts. And dysfunction will keep you distant from discernment. This is the classic outworking of human-centered favoritism. You look at it even from your own lives. Every time you have allowed the gift to override your character, every time you have lived your lives with, with, with your immature version of yourself calling the shots, you are going to see that you're going to be distant from where God wants you to be. True story? Am I making this up? Right? This is what we see happen in the life of Joseph. But I didn't call you here to just make you feel all shameful and guilty. There is hope. Because while all of this is being played out in the life of Joseph, God is still working in the life of Joseph and through the life of Joseph. You see, in spite of his limitations and his flaws, what we remember and what, what the scripture teaches us is God still approved Joseph. God still approved Joseph. Can I tell you one more time, church? God still approves you. In spite of your maturity, in spite of your dysfunction, in spite of the gifts that you carry that you think are going to take you through, let me tell you, there's a, there's a God, his, his name is Jesus Christ, and He approves you, He sees you in spite of every possible dysfunction that you might be caught up in the middle of. Because God had already approved Joseph when He showed compassion to his mother, Rachel. And so if you're here on the face of earth, I want to tell you there's a God who has a plan for you. There's a God who, who desires to lead you in every segment of your life. And that's how much he has favored you. But what I want to show to, to you tonight is there are three instances that mark God's favor over Joseph's life. Now, for, for the lack of time, I'm not going to dive into the details of the scriptures. But we're going to see three big instances about the contagious nature of divine favor. We're still talking about God's favor, by the way. Right? We're still talking about God's favor. And I want to give you those three in a snippet. The first one is the house of Potiphar. When Joseph is sold off, he, he's bought by this guy called Potiphar, who was a, who was a high-ranking officer, and he was... He was one of the officials of the Pharaoh. And so, so Potiphar's, Joseph in Potiphar's house is one moment where we experience a contagious nature of divine favor. That's the first one. Right? Somebody say it with me, the first one. Let's talk about the second one. Any guesses? Come on. Yeah, you said it. What's that? The prison. The second one is when Joseph is thrown into the prison. Why? We'll get to it. And the third one is what? The palace. the palace. Right? So Potiphar's house, the prison, and the palace. All right? These are the three instances where we see Joseph's life marked by not just any kind of favor. Somebody say it with me. Contagious favor. I'll just show it to you from the very first one. Let's read Genesis 39 verses 1 to 6. Genesis 39, verses 1 to 6. Now Joseph, after being sold by his brothers, was taken to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord had given him success in everything he did. Joseph found what? Favor. favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of Part of, the, of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left 
everything he had in Joseph's care. And with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. I don't know if you caught this, but I love verse 5 that is in your Bibles. Can we just read that one more time? Verse 5. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed whose household? The household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. This is what I mean when I talk about contagious favor. When the favor of God is upon you, people around you will see the evidence of it. When the favor of God is upon you, people around you will witness it. Let me go ahead and say what the Bible teaches us in this verse. When the favor of God is upon you, others around you will be blessed because of what you carry. What do you carry, church? You carry the presence of the living God. You carry Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. You carry Jesus, the life giver. You carry Jesus, the healer. You carry Jesus, who is the lover of your soul. You carry the grace and the favor of God wherever you are. And so I don't know about you, if my Bible teaches me that because of Joseph, Potiphar and his household was blessed, I better believe it. I don't care about what prosperity gospel theories and conspiracies are happening outside. This is not one of them. This is the truth of the word of God. This is what it says. Because of the favor of God on your life, people around you will be blessed. People around you will be blessed. And so God's favor has the power to impact your surroundings and your seasons. You think I'm asking you to, to, to believe for the favor of God just so that you can get blessed? You have no idea what can happen to those around you. You, ha you have no idea what can happen when the church of Jesus learns to walk and thrive in the favor of God. You have no idea as to how much Jesus desires that you walk in his favor. And so we see that, that your diligence and your humble and contrite posture before God attracts his approval and his delight on you. In this season, in this particular season that we spoke about, Potiphar's household, this is how uh, divine favor looked like in Joseph's life. So you ready for that? This is what it looked like. It looked like wisdom, it looked like leadership, it looked like management, and it looked like maturity. Let me ask you this. Any slave that is bought in those days from the market, could he just be put up in, in, terms, in places of leadership and places of influence? Yet we see this happen in the life of Joseph. This is a time where we are seeing the maturing of Joseph's life. This is a time where we are seeing divine favor can look different things in different seasons. In this season of Joseph's life, it looked like strategic management. It looked like strategic leadership. It looked like wisdom. The king's God is trusting you with the household and the fields that were there. That means you are the best asset manager that has been found. Or if you understand another language, you're the best fund manager that has been found. Can you imagine what it means to, to, to have access to all the assets that Potiphar had? Because somebody trusted you. Joseph was just a slave. Or let me say it, a dysfunctional slave. And yet he was trusted with everything that was, in tr that, that was around him. The wisdom of God... And the favor of God will cause that to happen in your life. Where people will look to hear from you because of what you carry. It doesn't matter about what has been happening to you. But it's really about who's on the inside of you. So in this season, things look very different for Joseph. 
But then this season does not last that long for Joseph, like you know. You know, his, his wife, that is Potiphar's wife, accuses him that he tried to take advantage of, of him and he gets thrown into prison. That's the second, second area of God's contagious favor. And this is what happens. It looks different. In, in, in Genesis 39, this is what it says. When Joseph is put in the prison, this is what happens. Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison because of what he was accused of. The place where the king's prisoners were confined, but while Joseph was there in the prison, here it comes again, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. This guy seems to be acing it all of a sudden, right? Let me tell you, I know we have, we have a lot of working folks in this room who work for success. Come on, do I, do I have people in this room who work for success? Right? rest of you just working for paychecks. <laughs> right? Let me tell you, you can work hard for success, but there is a success that the Lord gives. You didn't hear me, because if you, if you really understood what this scripture is teaching us, you wouldn't be looking at me with such long faces. I know you'll say, and then I'm processing it. No, let me, let me help you see what the scripture wants you to see. The Lord was with Joseph. And because of the Lord being with Joseph, there was good success over the life of Joseph, even in the prison. Even in the prison. Now, now here's, what I, here's why I want to show you this, this season of, of Joseph being in the prison. Even in the prison, the favor of God could not escape him. Now let me tell you what Joseph did in the prison. If you go back and read, he had a very peculiar moment where he got to translate and interpret the dreams of the fellow prisoners who were around him. Do you remember that? There were no, there were no just fellow prisoners. Who were they? One of them was a cupbearer and the other one was a baker, right, who was put into prison. I'll tell you this because your gifts sometimes are meant to be practiced well in the hidden seasons of your life. Sometimes you're always doubting yourself, am I gifted? Am I gifted? Am I gifted? Am I gifted? You know why? Because maybe sometimes in a particular season of your life, you do not have a platform to showcase your gifts. You have a prison. You have a prison, and that makes you wonder, is my gift any good? What I have, I mean, is it, is it good enough? I mean, I, I would love what, what that person has. I would love what the other person has, you know, because they're doing so much more. But let me tell you, this is what divine favor for Joseph looked like in the season of where he was in the prison. This is what it looked like. It looked like working on your gift in the hidden places with diligence and with excellence. Some of you have been gifted by God. There's no two ways about it. But some of you might be feeling like you're in the prison or you're in the hidden places, the hidden season of your life. Let me tell you, this season is a temporary season. Don't try to run away from it. Don't try to short fuse it. Don't try to escape it. Don't try to make it shorter than what God intends it for you to be. It's in the hidden season where God is asking you to exercise your gifts. It's in the hidden season where God is asking you to do all that he has already gifted you for. With diligence and with excellence. Joseph did not cut any corners. Joseph did not cut any corners. He was excellent in whatever did. The church needs to see and model the excellence that has been gifted to us. Stop being lousy Christians.
I'm not shouting at you. <laughs> I'm just presenting the truth. There are enough of lousy people out there who don't practice diligence. Let's not be one of those. I was sat down once by my manager when I was working this job in 2008. And he was a young manager, you know. He sat me down and he had seen me cut some corners, you know, when I was working. And he just pulled me to the side. He called me, you know, one, you, have you had those one-on-ones with your managers? I think you guys are the managers that have the one-on-ones with someone, you know. I don't know what conversations you have, but this was one of the conversations that he had with me. He's like, Nanan, you're playful at your work. You're good also at your work. I just hope you did it with excellence. That's all that he had to say. It crushed me like I felt like I was sitting in a one-hour sermon. <laughs> you know, sometimes when, you know, when people around you see your true potential, they will always desire that you live up to that. But there's a version of you that doesn't want to do that. And Joseph, in this season, learned the value of diligence and the value of excellence. In, somebody say this with me, in the hidden places. What are the hidden places that God is taking you through in this time? God is asking you to practice diligence. Okay, let's, 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 let's look at the third one, all right? This, this is the most classic one. Some of you have read this. Some of you have known about this. The third phase is a, is a life-defining moment, not just for Joseph, but for generations. All right? Keep this in mind when I say this, not just for Joseph, but for generations. And not just for generations, somebody say this with me, the storyline of God. This is exciting because what happens in the palace is not just saving Egypt. What is happening in the palace through Joseph is, is kind of fulfilling the God's covenantal promise that was given to Abraham. And so he's taken to the palace because he translates the dream of somebody who's working for the Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, Pharaoh has a dream and it's, it's a crazy dream. Nobody is able to translate that. The guy tells him, I know a guy who's there in the prison. The Pharaoh says, bring him to me. When he's brought to him, this is the conversation after Pharaoh explains the dream. To, to Joseph, Joseph translates that dream to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is flabbergasted. Pharaoh's like, wow. He says more than that, which we will just read. Genesis 41, verses 37. This is what Pharaoh says after this conversation is pretty much over. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? In whom, the spirit, in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Verse 39 teaches us Pharaoh's adoration for the gift that Joseph has. I believe something drastic has happened in the life of Joseph which we have been unpacking. Now let me bring you back to the context. You remember the 17-year-old Joseph who tried to, to speak a dream in his family? What happened when he, when he spoke out that dream? Was the dream true? Was a gift there? Yeah, Joseph was still gifted. The dream was still true. What happened? He was speaking to a bunch of known people who knew a version that Joseph did not know. Not the favored one. The favorite one. Not the mature one. The immature one. And so in one season, when you're saying the right things, but what is happening on your heart and around your life is totally so distant from how God wants you to live your life, you might be saying the right thing, but you will not see the desired impact happening through what you are saying. And so some, some of you are saying, I know the Bible, Nenad. 
I know the scripture. I've been praying the scripture. I've been, I've been doing all of that I can. I know everything that you guys are asking me to do. I'm not seeing it. When was the last time you checked on your maturity? When was the last time you allowed your dysfunction to be dealt by the true power of the gospel? Because the same dreamer with the same gift is standing not in front of the family, he's standing in front of the Pharaoh who's basically known to run an entire nation and this guy sees what others in him cannot see. Nobody as wise and discerning as you. Can you imagine how liberating it must be for Joseph? He's like, I tried telling this, the same thing to my brothers. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Of course they did not get it, Joseph. Because all that they were seeing is an arrogant, favorite child showing off. But this Joseph, not the favorite one, the favored one. Somebody say this with me, not the favorite one, but the favored one. Are you just trying to live as God's favorite or as God's favored? The favored Joseph is a different guy altogether. He's been through the pit, he's been through the palace, now when he's shown up at the palace, he's been through the pit, he's been through the prison, and now that he's shown up at the palace, he's still holding on to his true character. There's a part in the scripture, if you go back and read, Pharaoh thinks that Joseph can interpret dreams, but he stops Pharaoh over there. He says, it's not me, but God. The favorite one would have said, oh, come Pharaoh, let me tell you. He would have blabbered, shot himself in the foot again and maybe gone into a prison again, you know, for if he would. But thank God that does not happen. The favored Joseph is diligent. The favored Joseph is, is, is wise, is discerning, is practicing excellence. That's the beauty and the power of the contagious nature of favor. So he stands before the most powerful entity and he tells him what God is going to do. And he says, man, you're the best guy for the job. You're hired. Let's not even talk about salary and everything. You have whatever you want. When do you join? Now. Uh, what do I do? Everything. How do I do it? You decide. And that's exactly what happens, right? Pharaoh basically trusts him for the next 14 years of his life. It's funny, and this is, this is something that the Lord just dropped in my spirit, so I want to share it with you. It may come across a bit raw. One man had to labor for 14 years to work for his reward. Joseph stewarded those 14 years just to restore all that was lost in one generation. I believe that can be your story. Your father's messed up, your family messed up, your, your, your four generations and generations before that did not know how to live for Jesus and everything. Stop calling out your dysfunction. Stop tolerating and entertaining your dysfunction. What was lost in one generation can be stewarded and redeemed in another generation by those who are the favored ones of God. You and I, as we sit here, I want you to understand in this season, when Joseph was in the palace, what looked like favor was so different to what looked like favor in Potiphar's house, what looked like favor in the prison. When Joseph was in the palace, this is what favor looked like. It was not just about diligence. It was not just about ex excellence. It was about strategic leadership. It was about safeguarding the covenant promises. It was about restoration and healing. It was about dealing with your dysfunction. It was dealing with your dysfunction. You know what's, what's so amazing? His brothers eventually owned up 
to the dream that they wanted to distance themselves from. God knows how to fulfill every season of your life if you allow him to. During the time of seven years of famine, Jacob and his kids and his children and his family could have been wiped off if it wasn't for Joseph. Do you see it now when I say the favor of God is for an assignment which is far beyond you? Joseph was not sent to the palace to enjoy the luxuries of the palace. Joseph was sent to the palace so that the covenant promises could continue. You have the favor of God so that God's covenant can be established in you and God's covenant can be established through you wherever you are sent. Wherever you are placed, wherever you are positioned, you and I are called to forward the covenant promises of God. You and I are called to see the restoration and the healing power of Jesus to manifest in you and through your life. And so here's the caution that I want to leave you with tonight. You've heard about the contagious nature of favor in, in all the seasons of Joseph. I want to challenge some of you and maybe all of you in this room tonight. What is it going to take you to lay behind you the immature version of yourself? What will it take for you to not allow the dysfunctions in your life to dictate the future of your life? Joseph learned to say goodbye to his immaturity. Joseph learned to say goodbye to his dysfunction. And I believe one of the reasons he was put in the palace was because he practiced what it, what it looks like to walk and thrive in the favor of God. God's divine favor is powerful and able to redeem every dysfunction in your life. I say that with all truth, with all honesty, church. Somebody say this with me, every. I need you. I know maybe the, the belief and the faith is catching up to the statement, but can we for the next few seconds just say it like we believe it? Can somebody say this with me one more time? Every dysfunction. It doesn't matter how messed up your past has been. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how messed up your present looks like as well. God is not shaken by your dysfunctions. God is not broken because he sees a broken person in front of him. If dysfunction was a qualifier for the favor of God, none of us could have made it. If, 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 if your gifts and the excellence of your gifts was a qualifier for the favor of God, very few could cut it. But thank God for His faithfulness who doesn't look at your gifts, who doesn't look at your, at your dysfunctions, who looks at your willingness and the ability in you that are you willing to be seen by God. Because one thing that is so evident in and through the life of Joseph, God saw Joseph. God sees you. That's why the Bible says he's El Rohi, the God who sees. The God who sees. Thank you for tuning in for that message. We really hope that that has blessed your heart immensely. At Zealous, it's our desire that Jesus would meet you at the point of your need and that you would truly grow in the love and the grace that he has to offer each one of us. 
And that's why if you have been enjoying the content that has been coming to you, I wanna encourage you to subscribe to our channel, to share this content with your friends and your loved ones, and maybe even consider partnering with us as we take the message of the gospel beyond the four walls of Zealous. Once again, it means so much for us when you join in. So thank you for being here with us. God bless you and may you have a great week ahead.